Good afternoon and uh, welcome colleagues, invited guests, members of the general public who are following today's proceedings of the Standing Senate Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs. Today we continue our consideration of Bill C-16, an act to amend the Canadian Human Rights Act and the Criminal Code uh, with uh, this our last day of hearings on the bill. Uh, we will move to clause by clause consideration tomorrow. With us today for the first hour are Jordan B. Peterson, Professor of Psychology Department of the University of uh, Toronto, and from the D. Jared Brown Professional Corporation, uh, D. Jared Brown, Lead Counsel. Uh, thank you gentlemen for being here. Uh, you both have up to five minutes for uh, opening uh, statements, and Mr. Peterson, I believe you're going to lead off, Professor. The floor is yours. So, I think the first thing I'd like to bring up is that it's not obvious when considering a matter of this sort what level of analysis is appropriate. If you're reading any given document, you can look at the words or the phrases or the sentences or the complete document, or you can look at the broader context within which it is likely to be interpreted. And when I first encountered Bill C-16 and its surrounding policies, it seemed to me that the appropriate level of analysis was to look at the context of interpretation surrounding the bill which is what I did when I went and uh, scoured the Ontario Human Rights Commission web pages and examined its policies. I did that because at that point the Department of Justice had clearly indicated on their website in a link that was later taken down that Bill C-16 would be interpreted in within the uh, precedents, policy precedents already established by the Ontario Human Rights Commission. So when I looked on the website I thought well there's broader issues at stake here and I tried to outline some of those broader issues in the initial, you may or may not know, I made some videos criticizing Bill C-16 and, and a number of, its, uh, of the policies that surrounding it. And I think the most egregious elements of the policies are that it requires compelled speech. The, uh, the Ontario Human Rights Commission explicitly states that refusing to refer to a person by their self-identified name and proper personal pronoun, which is the pronouns that I was objecting to, uh, can, be, uh, can be interpreted as harassment. And so that's, an exp that's explicitly defined in the relevant policies. Um, so I think that's appalling, first of all, because there hasn't been a piece of legislation that requires Canadians to utter a particular form of address that has particular ideological implications before and I think that it's a line that we shouldn't cross. Um, then I think that the, the definition of identity that's enshrined in the surrounding policies is um, ill-defined and poorly thought through and also incorrect. Um, it's incorrect in that identity is not and will never be something that people define subjectively because your identity is something that you actually have to act out in the world as a set of procedural tools which most people learn and I'm being technical about this between the ages of two and four. It's a fundamental human reality. It's well recognized by the relevant say developmental psychological authorities. And so the idea that identity is something that you define purely subjectively is an idea without status as far as I'm concerned. I also think it's unbelievably dangerous for us to move towards uh, representing a social constructionist view of identity in our legal system. The social constructionist view insists that human identity is nothing but a consequence of socialization, which is, which, and, and there's an in, inordinate amount of scientific evidence suggesting that that happens to not be the case. And so the reason that this is being instantiated into law um, is because the people who are promoting that sort of perspective, or at least in part because the people who are promoting that sort of perspective know perfectly well that they've lost the battle completely on scientific grounds. It's implicit in the policies of the Ontario Human Rights Commission that sexual uh, identity, uh, biological sex, gender identity, gender expression, um, sexual proclivity, all vary independently and that's simply not the case. It's not the case scientifically, it's not the case factually, and it's certainly not something that should be increasingly taught to people in high schools, elementary schools, and junior high schools, which it is, and it is being taught. I included this uh, cartoon character that I find particularly reprehensible, aimed obviously at it as it is at children somewhere around the age of seven. 
that contains within it the implicit, con the implicit claims as a consequence of its graphic mode of expression that these elements of identity are first canonical and second independent and neither of those happen to be the case. I think that uh, the inclusion of gender expression in the bill is something extraordinarily peculiar given that gender expression is not a group and that according to the Ontario Human Rights Commission it deals with things as mundane as how behavior and outward appearance such as dress, hair, makeup, body language and voice which now as far as I can tell uh, open people to charges of hate crime under Bill C-16 if they dare to criticize the manner of someone's dress which seems to me to be an entirely voluntary issue. So um, I think that the Ontario Human Rights Commission's uh, attitude towards vicarious liability is designed specifically to be punitive in that it makes employers responsible for um, harassment or discrimination including the failure to use uh, preferred preferred pronouns, they have vicarious liability for that, whether or not they know it's happening, whether or not the harassment was, and whether or not the harassment was intended or unintended. Right. And so I'll stop with that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brown. I'm a litigator in Toronto. I act in all manner of commercial and employment disputes. I'm not an academic. I live with my clients in the land of legal reality and how the law actually works. About two years ago, I began to see claims of discrimination included in every employment-related court claim. My phone now rings weekly with human rights tribunal matters. It has become a reality for employers across Canada. In August of last year, I became aware of Dr. Jordan Peterson. He was discussing what he saw as a problematic law, poorly written. That's when I observed the oddest thing happening. Lawyers, academic lawyers, important people began to say that he had the legal stuff wrong. Nothing unusual about this bill. And they also said, you don't get to go to jail if you breach a human rights tribunal order. What was happening is they weren't defending the law, but downplaying its effects. Now, as a practicing lawyer, anytime a lawyer, and particularly an academic, says, look away, there's nothing to see here, it gets my antenna way up. So I did some research, which can be found in the brief that I filed in advance of today. It sets out the path to prison on this. I knew as a commercial litigator that anyone can end up in jail if you breach a tribunal order. It is a simple civil contempt of court process. People go to jail for this. But what about the freedom of expression issue? It's a foundational issue. We all know that Section 2B of the Charter sets out that everybody has the fundamental freedoms of thought, belief, opinion and expression. And we all know that the government has successfully restricted freedom of expression over the years. But what if rather than restricting what you can't say, the government actually mandated what you must say. In other words, instead of legislating that you cannot defame someone, for instance, the government says when you speak about a particular subject, let's say gender, you must use this government-approved set of words and theories. The American jurisprudence clearly defines this as unconstitutional compelled speech. In Canada, the Supreme Court has enunciated the principle that anything that forces someone to express opinions that are not their own is a penalty that is totalitarian and as such alien to the tradition of free nations like Canada. Now how does C-16 get us to compelled speech? The Minister of Justice has summarized Bill C-16 as the enactment amends the Canadian Human Rights Act to add gender identity and gender expression to the list of prohibited grounds of discrimination. The Department of Justice website used to say that we must look to the Ontario Human Rights Commission policies for definitions on these terms. Ontario's policies on gender identity and gender expression are set out in my brief. They state that gender-based harassment can involve refusing to refer to a person by their self-identified name and proper personal pronoun. Refusing to refer to a trans person by their chosen name and a personal pronoun that matches their gender identity will likely be discrimination. The law is otherwise unsettled as to whether someone can insist on any one gender-neutral pronoun in particular. If the harasser didn't know or didn't intend to harass, it's still harassment. Now why is this important? Well, in Ontario, the Human Rights Commission is a policy development creature of the legislature. It creates the policies which interpret the code. But what is most important, the tribunal must follow these policies. It is bound by them. So the Commission creates the law on pronouns. In Ontario, the policies on pronouns were introduced into the legal framework after the law had left the legislature. Federally, the same process will be followed as the Department of Justice had said so. A similar guideline will be developed. As with the Ontario policies, 
Federal guidelines must be followed by the federal tribunal. The guidelines will mandate pronouns. This will happen after the bill leaves the Senate. Mandating use of pronouns requires one to use words that are not their own, which imply a belief in or an agreement with a certain theory on gender. If you try to disavow that theory, you can be brought before the Human Rights Commission for misgendering or potentially find yourself guilty of a hate crime. To sum up on the subject of gender, we're going to have government mandated speech. Now, in opining on the constitutionality of the proposed bill, the Department of Justice said on its website, look, there's a variation of this bill that already exists in most of the provinces. I don't believe that's a robust argument in favor of constitutionality. I would refer you to the comments of the now Chief Justice McLaughlin of the Supreme Court in the decision of Taylor. It's in my brief. The chilling effect of leaving overbroad provisions on the books cannot be ignored, while the chilling effect of human rights legislation is likely to be less significant than that of a criminal prohibition, the vagueness of the law means it may well deter more conduct than can legitimately be targeted. As a lawyer on the ground, I worry about poorly drafted, a poorly drafted law and its impact on my clients. As a Canadian, I worry about Parliament tacitly authorizing compelled speech. The brief I provided to the committee contains a comprehensive legal opinion that I published back in December on C-16. There's a table that shows how the federal human rights regime mirrors the Ontario system in terms of enforcement of policies and guidelines. I have to wrap up, sir. And finally, it includes the case law that underpins the opinion. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, both. And we'll begin uh, questions beginning with the uh, Deputy Chair, Senator Baker. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses for their uh, presentation. Um, as the witnesses know, the nine provinces in Canada uh, have uh, uh, the, um, the provision in their laws, uh, including Ontario, uh, and also the words expression, as I recall, appears in four or five provinces. Um, so what you are arguing is against what we already have in law. Your reference to the criminality, the, to the sections of the criminal code, at our last meeting, Senator Joyal correctly pointed out uh, that sections 318 and 319 starts off by genocide, under the heading genocide. The next heading is uh, public incitement likely to lead to a breach of the peace. And you know what a breach of the peace is, Mr. Brown. Willful promotion of hatred. These things are, and then there are defenses listed, as you know, in that criminal code provision. There are several defenses. If you honestly believe in what you said, is if, if you, you know, the, the defenses are extensive in the criminal code. They've worked well for Canada. So what do you have to say about the facts of what's presently in the criminal code and your reflection that somehow uh, the genocide heading, the heading on public incitement, on willful promotion of hatred, somehow that these provisions should not be included under those headings? I think I have to be clear. My presentation relates to the amendments of the Human Rights Code or the and proposed amendments. And not to amendment. the criminal code? And that is, in fact, how uh, one like Dr. Peterson may, in fact, find themselves on the wrong side of jail. And so if you've, if you've reviewed the, uh, the publication in the opinion, I say that uh, simply by breaching the, uh, the proposed amendment to the, uh, to the Human Rights Act, um, and particularly with somebody who is deliberately doing so, for instance, somebody who is saying, I'm not going to use those words, that person, if they are dragged before the tribunal, the Ontario tr Tribunal. Or the Federal Tribunal. Mm -hmm. I've indicated to you already that the Department yeah. of Justice yeah. has said yeah. they're going to pass the same guideline on pronouns. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm suggesting to you is that if somebody says, I'm not going to use those words, are brought before the Tribunal, the Federal Tribunal, and the Tribunal then delivers uh, an order for a payment of a fine and mm -hmm. alternatively mm -hmm. a non-monetary remedy i.e. cease and desist order, mm -hmm. uh, uh, an order to do something, to compel them to do mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And that person who's brought before the tribunal says, I'm not doing that. They will find themselves in contempt of court, and prison is the likely 
uh, uh, outcome of that process until they purge the contempt. That's what I'm suggesting. I'm not suggesting to you that uh, that the uh, amendments to the criminal code. Um, well, I'm, I'm not advocating genocide. I guess let's just say that. And my my presentation here is is restricted to what I see as the pronoun policy issue and the compelled speech issue. So it covers the provincial legislation that you did strongly disagree with that we've had in place in the provinces for decades in some cases. It is the policies that were enacted after it left the legislature and which will be enacted after this bill leaves this, uh, this committee. I would also like to add to that the fact that once I made the video stating that I wouldn't use the Z and Zer pronouns, for example, which I regard as part of an ideological linguistic vanguard, the university lawyers, after carefully considering what I said, sent me two letters to cease and desist in my public utterances because they believed that not only was I violating the university's standards of conduct, but that I was also violating the relevant provisions of the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Therefore, as far as I could tell, vindicating the statement that I made when I made the video to begin with, which was that the act of making the video itself was probably already illegal. And they didn't do that lightly. Under so, provincial law? Yes. Senator Platt. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, gentlemen, both of you, for being here. Uh, I have uh, two questions, one for Dr. Peterson uh, right at the get-go, and then one for the two of you. Uh, hopefully the Chair will uh, indulge me. Uh, deliberations of this bill, and during deliberations of this bill, we keep hearing the term respect thrown around. Respect is indeed critical in debates of legislation as sensitive of, as this. And there are a lot of people here who need to be reminded that respect works both ways, including people at this committee. Uh, Dr. Baker, has, or uh, Senator Baker has already referred to comments as genocide. I don't think anybody here is promoting genocide. However, Dr. Peterson, can you comment on the notion of respect where some of your critics say, why can you not just respect your students, just use the gender neutral pronouns? How do you respond to that? Well, first of all, I'd have to be convinced that doing so would do more good than harm, and I don't believe that. And I, I think I'm actually in a reasonable position to, to, to justify my claim. I think that the danger that's intrinsic to the law far outweighs whatever potential benefit it might produce, especially given that there's no hard evidence whatsoever for any benefit. I would also like to point out that the people who are promoting this legislation claim to be acting on the behalf, behalf, say, of the transgendered community, but they weren't not elected nor appointed to act as such representatives and are doing it on their own say-so. I've received many letters, at least 30 now, from transgendered individuals indicating that the, they are not in accordance with the, the claims of these so-called representatives to be representing or with the intent of the legislation, which has actually made them more visible rather than less visible, which is, and the less visible is what they had preferred. With regards to respect is that you don't meet people, generally speaking, in a mutual display of respect. You generally meet people in a mutual display of alert neutrality, which is the appropriate way to begin an interaction with someone, because respect is something that you earn as a consequence of reciprocal interactions with that are dependent on something like reputation, which is also a consequence of repeated interactions. And so the notion that addressing someone by their um, self-defined self-identity is necessarily an indication of basic human respect for them, I think is an entirely spurious argument, especially given that there's no evidence that moving the language in a compelled manner in this direction is going to have any beneficial effect. We're supposed to assume that just because hypothetically the intent is positive that the outcome will be positive and any social scientist worth his or her salt knows perfectly well that that's rarely the case. So, Dr. Brown, uh, you've talked about uh, non-monetary orders uh, that could include sanctions like orders to undertake sensitivity and anti-bias training. I would like uh, either one or both of you to comment on uh, whether you could explain why an individual may have a strong objection to undertaking such a training. And Mr. Brown, could you let the committee know how serious the sanction could be? And of course, you already did on that uh, if you refuse to undertake such an order. 
uh, and specifically at the federal level. But what would, what would, why would people have an objection to taking such training? Well, I think I'm going to let Dr. Peterson answer why he or someone like him might have an, uh, an objection to undertaking that type of training, and then I'll deal obviously uh, once again with the severity of that decision if it gets before the tribunal. Well, I have a profound objection to, to undergoing such training. In fact, I would flatly refuse under all conditions to undergo it. And the reason, there's multiple reasons for that. The first reason is that the science surrounding the, uh, the, the, the so-called charge of implicit bias that's associated with perception is by no means settled in, 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 to such a degree that to one of the three people who designed the most commonly used measure, which is the implicit association test, has detached himself from the other two uh, researchers on the grounds that the use of the test has become has far transcended its scientific validity and reliability. It's nowhere near valid or reliable enough to be used in the manner that it's been using. And even the more uh, pro-IAT researchers who developed the test have admitted to that publicly, even though they haven't stressed it nearly to the degree they should have. So first of all, the science is, is not settled and is being used absolutely inappropriately. And I can say that as a clinician because I know the, and as a psychometrician, I know the criteria for using a test for essentially diagnostic purposes and the IAT doesn't even come close to what's necessary. And then the next issue is, well, where's the evidence that, un, that anti-unconscious bias training works? There's no evidence and what little evidence there is suggests that it actually has the opposite effect because people don't like being brought in front of a re-education committee and having their fundamental perceptions, you see, their perceptions, not even their thoughts, but their perceptions themselves, altered by collective fiat. It's an unbelievable... Thank you there, sir. Yeah. Uh, we have a very engaged committee. Concise questions and concise responses would be uh, helpful. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I want to quote uh, briefly from a, a document from the Ontario Human Rights Commission says some people may not know how to determine what pronoun to use. Others may feel uncomfortable using gender neutral pronouns. Generally, when in doubt, ask a person how they wish to be addressed. Use they if you don't know which pronoun to you is preferred. Simply referring to their person by their chosen name is always a respectful approach. So you can use a pronoun, you can choose, you can use their chosen name. So if someone chooses to change his name from Paul to Peter, Surely you would use Peter because it's a matter of simple politeness and, and respect. If the same person, person chooses to ch ch change her name from Paul to Paula, wo I won't use, use the name Paula simply as a matter of respect. What's the difference well, well, here? Well, I guess the issue, at, and, and speak about the legal issue there, is that you're now introducing the full force of the law behind the requirement to use and I'm dealing obviously with, with respect to the pronoun issue. In terms of not addressing somebody by their by their legally registered name, for instance, um, uh, I don't think that's where we're running into trouble here. I think the issue becomes that if you don't u address somebody by the uh, the pronoun that they self-identify by, as I've read out to you, the fact that the full force of the law will be behind uh, that person, um, that that's what I, I'm uh, finding is tr troubling in the legislation. But the Ontario Human Rights Commission gives Per people the alternative not to use pronouns and use the person's chosen name, it, which is always a respectful approach. So pronouns are not necessary, are not mandatory. You can always choose the person's chosen name as a respectful approach. And therefore, I argue... I, I'm not aware that anybody, that there is a, um, a piece of legislation that compels you to use my proper name. In other words, um, it, once again, it's the yeah. fact that the full force of the law will be behind it when we're dealing with the, the group being identified in the legislation. And so, for instance, if I were not to call you by your chosen name, I'm not sure you'd enjoy the full force of the law behind you uh, um, as a result of that. And that's what I'm suggesting to you is the difference here. I'm just arguing, sir, that you always base whatever you say on what the Ontario Human Rights Commission is saying. And I'm quoting from the Ontario Human Rights Commission document. They're saying we're not manda mandating pronouns. You can always use the person's chosen name as a respectful approach. I respectfully disagree. But then, well, I would say then that's actually an indication of just exactly how poorly the policy documents are written because I can quote this one, which, which is also from the Ontario Human Rights Commission website that says, and I quote, Refu refusing to refer to a person by their self-identified name and proper personal uh, 
proper personal pronoun counts, constitutes gender-based harassment. And so if, there, if the policies were written in a coherent manner and there wasn't internal contradictions, then your statement would be a reasonable objection. But since it's not written that way, and I do believe firmly that that's a testament to the, to the degree to which it's a poorly written set of policies, is that it's full of internal contradictions. And that'll be worked out very painfully within the confines of people's private lives. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Senator Batters. Thanks very much, both of you, for being here. Um, first of all, uh, Dr. Peterson, I want to go back to this issue of personal pronouns, and if you could please tell our committee more about this issue. It's something that I was not at all familiar with prior to this bill um, um, being introduced, and in particular about the gender-neutral pronouns and your experience in pushing back against being forced to use those gender-neutral pro gender pronouns. Well, I don't think the people who initiated this legislation ever expected that there would be an absolute explosion of, of identities, first of all, and also of, of so-called personal pronouns, as there has been. I think Facebook now recognizes something like 71 separate gender identity categories, each of which in principle is associated with its own set of pronouns. And so it's become, well, linguistically, un it's, it's become a parody, essentially. It's become linguistically unmanageable. And it's also the case that words can't be introduced into the language by fiat. I, don't, I, I can't even think of a time when that's actually worked. We're not exactly sure how words enter the common parlance, but it's certainly not that way. And so the, the, the legislation devolves into a kind of, of, of absurdity, as far as I can tell. I mean, one of the people that I discussed this with claimed that the way that you kept track of someone's personal pronouns was to use your cell phone as an adjunct to your communication. And I mean, that's... You wouldn't say anything like that if you knew anything about common human nature, let's say, and the manner in which people communicate with one another. Okay, so, so the types of pronouns you're talking about, just so everyone's clear, because I don't think these are common, common parlance, um, Z and Zer and what other sorts of gender-neutral pronouns are we discussing here? Well, I have a very bad memory for that sort of thing, but if you're interested in it, you can find lists of them very rapidly on the web, and, and they've been produced by, I think, they've been produced by people whose essential desire is to gain linguistic control. That's, that's, that's as simple as I can put it, is to gain linguistic control. But they're not used popularly. And, and that seems to me to be a, it, it's a real problem as a consequence that you make failure to make their use something that, that could carry a criminal penalty. So I just don't understand that. And, and I don't understand how the government can justify imposing a criminal penalty on the use of words that no one either knows or uses. It, it just seems preposterous to me, but okay. there it is. Could you please also tell us a little bit more about the, your personal experience in pushing back against this? And I mean, many are familiar with your story, but uh, not everyone, so I just want to give you a little well, bit Well, I made a video, actually I made three videos, but we'll just talk about one of them. I, I, I made one criticizing Bill C-16 for the reasons that I already described, because I went and read the policies, and I, they made my hair stand on end, the surrounding policies. And uh, so I made a video stating essentially that and detailed out my reasons. And, um, you know, I've been following the, the battle of, let's say, ideologies on campus for a very long period of time, and I, I suppose I have some expertise in that. And there's, a, there's an ideological war that's ripping the campuses apart, uh, and it's essentially between a an ideological variant that's rooted in what's come to be known as postmodernism with kind of a neo-Marxist base and, and modern, modernism, I would say. And that, that's accounting for all the turmoil on the campuses, and I see this as an extension of this campus turmoil into the broader world, and, and I really believe that is the proper level of analysis. I truly believe that. And so I said that I believe that this is the, a vanguard issue in a kind of ideological war and that I'm not going to participate on the side of the people whose, whose ideological stance I find reprehensible, unforgivable and reprehensible, especially the Marxist element of it. And so I announced that I wasn't going to use these words because I don't believe that they're instantiated to protect anyone's rights. I believe they're, that the, the, the ideologues who are pushing this movement are using unsuspecting and sometimes complicit members of the so-called transgender community to push their ideological vanguard forward, and I firmly believe that. So I'm not participating in that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it's potentially illegal for me not to participate in that 
is something that I regard as, I think that's absolutely dreadful. It, it's, it, make, it puts a shudder in my heart as a Canadian that we could even possibly be in a situation like that. You know, if, if, the, if the identity claims that are instantiated in, this leg, in the policy surrounding this legislation are applied, it's going to be hell for the psychiatrists, excuse my language, it's going to be very difficult for the biologists and the psychiatrists next. And I think we'll see that happening very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Gold. <clears throat> thank you, and thank you for being here. Um, uh, I, I've never been a practicing lawyer. Uh, I was a constitutional law professor, uh, and I'm a free speech guy. Um, so I appreciate the importance of the issues that are being raised. I, I think, respectfully, they were answered free speech issues were answered quite compellingly by my former colleague Brenda Cosman in testimony before this committee. But I, I wanted to make three points. Um, uh, Mr. Peterson, and, and there are questions sort of buried in these points. Um, you, I think I heard you say that you thought that the harm of, to this legislation outweighs the good. But, but, uh, but there is, the trans community suffers harm regularly when they're discriminated against. And whatever else one might say and worry about human rights tribunals and, and the like, this bill addresses and would take a major step forward towards reducing harm uh, that a particularly vulnerable community uh, um, experiences. Second, let's see if we can zero in on where we might agree that um, there is nothing in the law that criminalizes or creates a, an offense to criticize the notion that identity is a social construct, which you do, to criticize the way in which words come into the language. Though modern Hebrew is an example of words coming in by fiat, and the Academy Francaise does it as well. Of course, Shakespeare gave us so much of our language. But there's nothing in this bill that stands in the way of you taking a principled position against all aspects of this, including your criticisms of the activists. Um, the issue is the pronoun, and, and unless I'm reading it wrong, uh, as Senator Pratt pointed out, the Ontario Human Rights Commission policy does not say that refusing to use a, a person's self-identified name or personal pronoun does constitute gender-based harassment. I may, I may be wrong, but I believe it said it could. And I think that's a real difference. If, if I turn to you and say, look, Please call me they, because that's how I see myself now. Because it's hurtful for you to call me sir, um, or miss, whatever, whatever it would be. Uh, but you refuse. And I say, well, OK, if you're uncomfortable with that because you're not comfortable with that, call me Mark. And you refuse. Were you to continue to call me by the name that I'm telling you is hurtful to me? Is that not, in fact, something that is that not something that, that, that the law can properly address? This is you are knowingly hurting me, uh, and and in that respect, um, our courts ultimately, I think, are capable of striking a proper balance between people who slip up or who, for whatever reasons, just can't get the words out of their mouth and those that persist and intentionally causing opportunity to respond. Would you agree with my characterization of the of free speech as it applies to these issues? Let me jump in just on the legal point. It, uh, after Dr. Peterson posted his videos and after he rose to the public consciousness, um, the Ontario Human Rights Commission deemed it fit to release a new policy document called Questions and Answers about Gender Identity and Pronouns, and in so doing, they said that refusing to refer to a trans person by their chosen name and, per and a personal pronoun that matches their gender identity or purposely misgendering will likely be discrimination. So I think it's a little bit more certain than what you may have uh, uh, indicated in your comment, but I'll allow Dr. Um, uh, and once again, that, was, that policy was, was put out after um, Dr. Peterson um, began to speak on the issue. And so I think it's very telling that it was a, a, a response, if you will, to this, this um, this issue that Dr. Peterson raised. I'm going to allow, obviously, Dr. Peterson to go ahead with the uh, other element of your question. Very briefly, sir. Well, so I, I would say that the very idea that calling someone 
uh, a term that they didn't choose causes them such irreparable harm that legal remedies should be sought um, rather than regarding it as a form of impoliteness, that legal remedies should, should be sought, including potential violation of the hate speech codes, is an indication of just how deeply the culture of victimization has sunk into our society. Okay, we'll, we'll leave it there. Uh, Senator Frum. Here. Um, same topic, uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, when uh, the Minister of Justice was before this committee, um, she said the following, there is nothing within Bill C-16 that would compel somebody to have to call somebody by the pronoun he or she or otherwise. Can you comment on her position? I'd agree with that. There is nothing in, in the bill, but the problem is that in the, uh, the Government of Canada Department of Justice website, um, they, uh, in their questions and answers section of that website, which was pulled down in December, at tab five of my brief, it, it makes very clear that the definitions of the terms gender identity and gender expression have already been given by the Ontario Human Rights Commission. The Commission has provided helpful discussion and examples that can offer good practical guidance. The Canadian Human Rights Commission will provide similar guidance on the meaning of these terms in the Canadian Human Rights Act. Now I take that to be a state of <coughs> legislative intent and I'll agree with you that the, that the bill itself on its face does not seem to imply any manner of compelled speech but when we're tying it so deliberately and with this expectation, that's where I think you get into uh, into some trouble. And Chair, may I ask one more? Um, again, Mr. Brown, you, you spoke about the chilling effects of overly broad legislation. I'm wondering if you consider the terms gender identity and gender expression to be equally broad, or do you consider one broader than the other? Um, it, oh. I think they are overly broad definitions and uh, and I think the only thing I can offer uh, as a lawyer and a litigator is that um, the courts don't like over broad terms and, and I would refer you to the decision of, of uh, London Boisson of the Alberta Court of Appeal where in that case the Court of Appeal says the objective of statutory interpretation is to, dis to discern the legislative intent from the language of the legislation if possible and to give effect to such intent. This objective becomes difficult to attain where there is conflict, imprecision, or a lack of clarity in the legislation. Of, particularly, of particular concern in the area of human rights law is that a lack of clarity will cast a chill on the exercise on the, of the fundamental freedoms such as freedom of expression and religion. And so, um, while I personally believe that the, that the terms are not properly or not clearly defined and, and somewhat ambiguous, the courts uh, don't like that type of legislation either. Just to add two things, um, with regards to the chill, it's already the case, and I've seen this among my own students when they're teaching personality, which is what I teach, which also involves uh, assessment of gender differences between men and women, that the proclivity now is for the advanced PhD students to avoid any such discussions in their classrooms because the potential cost of transgressing against a, an unknown norm, let's say, is so high that it's just easier to teach other things. And so I've seen that clearly and with multiple people. And I would also say that it's no trivial matter that the Department of Justice's link to the Ontario Human Rights Commission and their statements about how this legislation was going to be interpreted mysteriously disappeared in the middle of December. Of all the things that have happened to me, uh, happened in relationship to this uh, that I've been studying, I think that was the most chilling. It's like because it was the it was the what would you say it was the smoking pistol right because the issue is what's the right level of analysis are you just supposed to look at the legislation well since the justice department said no you're supposed to look at the surrounding policies well that's what i did and that's what i based my case on and then all of a sudden the link to those the link tying those two things together just vanished and people had to go into the internet archives to 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 fish it back out so that it could remain part of the public record I think that's absolutely scandalous. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Senator Ahmedvar. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you both of you for being here. Um, I was trying to take notes, but I think I got this right, Mr. Peterson, that you talked about this bill as being an expression of the vanguard of ideology. Am I, am I right in thinking? In, in well, I was thinking more about the policies that surrounded it, but, but okay. yes. Yeah. So I'm trying to square what you, as a party of one, are saying with 
published documents from the Canadian Psychological Association, the American Psychological Association, the M Canadian Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the Canadian Psychiatric Association, and the United Nations Human Rights uh, Experts. So these are all, you know, these are not parties of one. They are associated. They are all, I imagine, lots of psychologists are members of the Canadian Psychology Association and the Canadian Psychiatry. So how do you square what you're saying, which is your opinion, uh, which you are absolutely entitled to, with what everyone is saying, plus the feelings and testimonies of the people who have suffered uh, over 30 years, who've been taking issues to court. These are people who, be, who, li who we've listened to. So how do we describe this? Okay, well, with regards to your second point, if the people that you're listening to aren't randomly selected from a population, then their opinions are worthless from the perspective of, of testimony because you don't know if you're dealing with a biased sample. And that's a big problem with the public consultation process that underlied this bill. And, and you can not appreciate that if you'd like, but it's standard practice in any, in any polling institution or any body that's attempting to extract a genuine opinion out of a so-called community of people. And if that isn't followed, then you can't tell if the information that you're, that you're receiving is biased. And this, with regards to your first point, what exactly are all those people who aren't thinking the same way as me saying? You said that there's a bunch of them and a bunch of groups, but you never said what they're saying precisely. Well, I'm... I think our chair would rule me out of order if I proceed no, you're to, fine. to read out what they're all saying. But in general, they say they oppose discrimination and harassment because of gender identity and gender expression. And then there's three pages, which I can share with you. I oppose discrimination against gender identity and gender expression. That's not the point. The point is the specifics of the legislation that surrounds it and the insistence that people will have to, be, have to use compelled speech. That's what I'm objecting to. I've dealt with all sorts of people in my life, very people who don't fit in in all sorts of different ways. I'm not a discriminatory person. There's 500 hours of my teaching to my classrooms on tape on YouTube, and nobody's found a smoking pistol. I'm not a discriminatory individual, but I think this legislation is reprehensible, and I do not believe for a moment that it will do what it intends to do. I also don't think that my opinion deviates substantially from the bodies that you're describing because you haven't provided any evidence that they say anything other than discrimination is a bad thing. And I think that unreasonable discrimination is a bad thing. And it's unreasonable when people are judged for any reason other than the specific competence that they bring to, say, a given position. It's not in anyone's best interest that that occurs. But I don't think that you've demonstrated in the least that the opinions that I'm putting forward are exist in opposition to the standard practices, of, say, of my particular discipline. So. Could you, re may I follow? Mm -hmm. Could you repeat one more time your response to Senators Gold and Pratt that the Ontario Human Rights Commission has provided what I would say reasonable alternatives uh, to your, your uh, objection to using pronouns? Well, I, I think it's been made clear in the, in the presentation so far is that it depends on which part of the Ontario Human Rights Commission's policies you read. And that's a big problem. I mean, that's that, one of the reasons I criticized this to begin with was because when I went through the policies, I could see that they're absolutely incoherent. So, for example, here, let me give you another example. So there's an insistence in the Ontario Human Rights Commission that sexual preference is an immutable phenomena which indicates, at least in principle, that it's biologically grounded. But on the same, by the same token, in exactly the same policies, they presume that sexual identity, gender identity, and gender expression are entirely independent. It's like, sorry, guys, you can't have both of those because one's A and one's not A, and you can't put those together. And like, there's, there's endless numbers of places in the policy uh, surround, surrounding Bill C-16 that are characterized by that kind of logical incoherency. And I mean, what's it going to do to people who are transgender, who are making the claim that they were, say, born that way at birth, which is a strong claim. That's a biological claim. It indicates that there's a direct causal connection between some biological phenomena and the expression of a particular identity. It's actually the strongest defense that people who have, let's call them non-standard sexual identities or gender identities, have to defend their okay. claims. I have to wrap it up there and move on to uh, Senator Boisvenu. Merci beaucoup, Mr. President. Euh, alors, je vais laisser le temps à, à nos invités de se, 
Monsieur le Président, 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 Monsieur le
But I put my finger on something, that's what I thought. And the fact that this issue hasn't gone away in nine months, quite the contrary, it's exploded not only in Canada but in all sorts of parts of the world, means, that I means to me that I have some evidence that my choice of level of analysis was correct and that there's far more going on here, so to speak, than the mere surface issue that we're purporting to discuss. And so I take exception to the notion that I'm somehow abandoning my personal responsibility to my students, which is something that I believe is in fact driving what I'm doing. I believe that my obligation to my students constantly is to tell them what I think and to make that as informed and careful an opinion as I can possibly matter, ma master, and that's what I do. Je pense que vous comprenez que si vous venez participer à un comité sénatorial sur l'examen d'un projet de loi, peu importe ce que vous pensez de la valeur des questions, poser la question ne vous appartient pas. On s'entend là-dessus. Ma question pour vous, c'est est-ce que vous faites une différence entre ce que vous croyez, votre opinion sur un projet de loi, et le fait que l'université, à moins que je me trompe, qui vous paye pour enseigner, vous considère comme sous sa responsabilité légale dans vos actions par rapport aux étudiants et donc dans une situation d'autorité par rapport à eux, c'est-à-dire que vous pouvez donner A ou E, c'est-à-dire A excellent uh, ou excellent. Senator, I, I encourage you to focus on the components of the legislation. I think uh, that's relevant. I'm, I'm going to move on. Uh, Senator McDonald. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dr. Peterson, I have a question for you. Um, the thing that concerns me most in this legislation is compelled speech. I think that's very con concerning. Um, this committee has heard from Megan Murphy, who told us her opposition to this concept of gender fluidity, fluidity because she believes gender is a social construction. And Dr. Gad Saad also opposed to this legislation because of his belief in evolutionary biology. What this shows is that with Bill C-16, we are prematurely shutting down a discussion on gender and sex that is far from settled, or appears to be far from settled. Um, and in my opinion, when we look to the provincial definition set up by the commissions, we are enshrining the theory of a gender spectrum into the law. I wonder if you can comment on that. That's exactly what we're doing. We're in, and I think, I think that that might even be more dangerous than, in my opinion, than the compelled speech issue. because. The social constructionist view of gender isn't another opinion; it's just wrong. So, because and I can I can tell you why that is fairly. I'll, I'll take one minute to do that. Please. Well, the proposition that's in, instantiated, for example, in this in this particular visual, which is a good representation of the of the philosophy of the policies, is that there's no causal relationship between the, these four dimensions of identity, and and that's palpably absurd. I mean, 98 percent of people. It's 99.7% it's of people who inhabit a body with a given biological sex identify with that biological sex. It's, it's, they're t incredibly tightly linked. If, if you can't uh, attribute causality to a link that that's tight, that's that <coughs> tight, you have to dispense with the notion of causality altogether. And then of the people who, who identify, say, as male or female, who are also biologically male or female, the vast majority of them have the sexual preference that would go along with that, and the gender identity, and the gender expression. These, these levels of analysis are unbelievably tightly linked, and the, the evidence that biological factors play a role in determining gender identity is, in a word, overwhelming. There isn't a serious scientist alive who would dispute that. Now, you get, you get disputes about it, but they always stem from essentially from the humanities. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I, I've looked at it very carefully. Those arguments are entirely ideologically driven. It's a tenant of the ideology that identity is socially constructed. And that's partly why it's been instantiated into law, because there's no way they're going to win the argument. But they can certainly win, let's say, the propaganda war, especially by foisting this sort of reprehensible uh, advertising information on children. And that's part of the, that's part of the express intent. I would add that the trans, uh, uh, trans complainants have been covered under the existing grounds of sex before the tribunals across uh, Canada. And as the Minister of Justice said, they are uh, bringing this legislation in as a symbolic gesture. And so uh, I leave it to you to question what that gesture may be, but, but uh, this community has been protected 
under the existing grounds that are, are found in most of the human rights codes across uh, across Canada on the grounds of sex. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Joel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Brown or uh, Mr. Peterson, the uh, uh, Justice Wagner from the Supreme Court in a seminar at the Ottawa University uh, in early March of this year, which was a couple of months ago, uh, stated the following. Of course, he was not uh, giving a decision from the bench, you know, but he was expressing his views. And if you allow me, I will quote him. It's short. When the court eventually faces a question touching on transgender identity, these two propositions will provide essential frames of reference. First one, that identity is not fixed but changing. That's the first proposal. Mm -hmm. And then the second one, that identity is not innate but contextual. I repeat, that identity is not innate but contextual. Uh, end of quote. Um, I, I, I read that and I tried to understand the implication uh, of this, you know, those two binary kinds of, uh, of uh, elements that and he says the court, so I bet that he might have spoken to colleagues or, you know, the profession generally. Would you, would you have a quarrel with that kind of approach to the definition of transgender uh, reality? Or if you think that it's a proper uh, way of approaching legally the issues, because as you forcefully explain, uh, Somebody one day might challenge, uh, you know, the proposal, the policies, uh, and all of what would, could stem from the enactment of those legislations. So, in other words, we'll find ourselves in the court one day, and we will have to, or, you know, to analyze and argue the case, at least taking into account that references, that those references that Justice Wagner mentioned not long ago. So how will you, you react to that uh, okay. well, I want to way make, of perception? I want to make sure I understand your question <coughs> properly. So when, when the justice said this, was he implying that uh, the identity is not fixed, but it is changing, and that identity wasn't innate, and it was contextual, or was he outlining the, 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 the arena within which this debate might take place? No, it was essentially, it was, you know, it was not a speech on this, essentially. It was more, if I can use an expression that Mr. Brown will understand, it was rather an obituary, you know, in a conference. The conference was about identity, but of course, uh, since, uh, you know, identity is a topic of common, you know, yeah. not common debate in Canada, he felt that uh, it was helpful if he would, you know, I should say, put his grain of salt in the, in the, in the public debate by establishing what he thinks is, you know, how to define transgender identity and establish some parameters. Okay, so let's, let's assume that it is changing and contextual. Yeah. Okay, then why is conversion therapy a problem? Mm. See, this is what, see, the thing is, is that when I started opposing this bill, people immediately assumed that I was transphobic and racist and all these other oh. epithets that they're perfectly willing to trot forth at a moment's notice. But you know, there's been a tremendous attempt to make conversion therapy for people who are gay illegal, right? And the proposition is predicated on the idea that the identity, the sexual preference identity is not changing nor contextual. Mm -hmm. It's fundamental and really what that means is that it's grounded in something like biology. It's okay, fine, let's scrap that, okay? Now it's gonna be changing and contextual. Mm -hmm. Okay, then why can't it be changed with context? Mm -hmm. And so but this is part of the problem with the policies is they're so incoherent that they're going to work against the people that they're designed to protect. Mm -hmm. Now, people have a hard time believing I care about that, but, you know, the fact that I've been called things doesn't mean that that's what I am. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of people who have, let's call it a non-standard identity, the, the tightest argument they have for public acceptance of that identity is that it's powerfully constrained by biological processes that are beyond their voluntary control. So instantiate this view of humanity, the social constructionist view of humanity, and you can wave those claims goodbye because they're completely, um, they, they are at complete odds with the social constructionist viewpoint. And I think that's a big mistake. And I, I really do believe that that will backfire hard against the people who 
this legislation is designed to protect. Mm -hmm. If it's mutable, changeable, only subjective and, and transformable on a whim, then why should anyone have any respect for it? Gentlemen, I'm going to have to intervene. The hour has flown by, and we uh, all very much appreciate your appearance here today and your testimony as well. Thank you. We'll suspend briefly before hearing from our next witnesses.
Uh, joining us for our second hour, uh, Bruce Party, a professor of the Faculty of Law at uh, Queen's University, and from the Justice Center for Constitutional Freedoms, Jay Cameron is a barrister and solicitor, and from the Quebec Women's Rights Association, Michelle Sirois, who is the president of the group, Diane uh, Gilbault, a vice president, and Lynn Jubenville. The treasurer and webmaster. I hope I've pronounced, pronounced those names correctly. Um, witnesses, you all uh, have, uh, spokespersons have uh, up to five minutes uh, for an opening uh, presentation, and uh, I believe we will begin with uh, Ms. Sirois. Uh, the floor is yours, madam. Honorable Senatrice et Senator, merci de nous avoir invité à témoigner sur le projet de loi C16. Comme citoyenne et comme féministe, nous sommes convaincus qu'il faut lutter contre les discriminations. Mais ces 16 n'ajoutent rien à la protection des droits de la perso des personnes transgenres. Par contre, ces 16 aura des, comme conséquence d'éliminer ou d'affaiblir des droits reconnus aux femmes, ce qui est inacceptable dans une société qui s'est engagée formellement à défendre ses droits. C'est pourquoi nous demandons une analyse comparative selon les sexes avant l'adoption de la loi. D'abord, nous aimerions préciser ce que nous entendons par les mots « genre » et « sexe ». Dans le cas de ce projet de loi qui parle d'identité de genre, une telle distinction est absolument essentielle. Le sexe réfère aux caractéristiques biologiques qui différencient les hommes et les femmes, comme le souligne Condition féminine Canada et toutes les organisations qui ont des responsabilités en matière d'égalité entre les sexes. Toutes constatent qu'il y a deux sexes. Le genre réfère aux attributs du féminin et masculin définis par le discours social, la culture et l'histoire. C'est donc un construit social. Et c'est ce dont il est question quand on parle de stéréotypes de genre. À la lumière de ces définitions, on peut se demander par quel artifice on en est venu à considérer qu'un changement de genre équivaut à un changement de sexe, ce qui est impossible. Maintenant, en quoi le projet de loi C-16 remet-il en question des droits chèrement acquis par les femmes au cours du dernier demi-siècle? Donnons quelques exemples. Premier exemple, dans le domaine du sport. En mars 2017, un haltérophile remportait le championnat international féminin d'haltérophilie, délogeant la médaille d'or de Rio. Jusqu'à l'an dernier, il compétitionnait du côté des hommes. Cette année, il s'est présenté comme transgenre et a donc été autorisé à se mesurer aux femmes. Les nouvelles normes que le CIO a adoptées très discrètement en 2016 permettent à des hommes qui se disent transgenres de se présenter comme des athlètes féminines si leur taux de testostérone ne dépasse pas 10 nanomoles par litre de sang, à savoir trois à quatre fois plus que le taux des femmes ayant le plus haut taux de testostérone, sans parler de la masse musculaire des athlètes mâles transgenres qui leur donne un avantage disproportionné par rapport aux femmes. Est-ce que cela veut dire que, do, que dorénavant, on triplerait le taux de testostérone acceptable chez les femmes, et cela avec les incitations au dopage que cela comporte? La participation croissante d'hommes qui se disent transgenres au sport féminin met en péril les chances des jeunes filles et des femmes de gagner des épreuves sportives, et ce, à tous les niveaux de compétition. Les femmes ont donc toutes les raisons de contester l'arrivée d'athlètes de sexe masculin dans leur compétition. Et avec C16, cette contestation deviendra difficile puisque les équipes féminines seront exposées à des poursuites. Est-ce équitable pour les femmes qui se sont battues pendant des décennies pour pouvoir faire du sport et participer aux Jeux olympiques? Au niveau des prisons, tout le monde se rappelle le colonel Russell Williams, reconnu coupable de 82 accusations, dont deux meurtres de femmes et de plusieurs agressions sexuelles. Le colonel Williams aimait se photographier dans les sous-vêtements de ses victimes après ses crimes. Pourquoi ne déciderait-il pas qu'il serait mieux dans une prison pour femmes? D'ailleurs, l'Association britannique des spécialistes de l'identité de genre a prévenu le gouvernement anglais qu'il fallait être très prudent face à ces demandes de transfert sur la base de l'identité de genre, parce que, disent-ils, Preuve à l'appui, un nombre croissant de prédateurs sexuels invoquent leur identité de genre, qu'elle soit avérée ou non, pour demander un transfert dans une prison pour femmes. 
quand rien ne vient cadrer cette identité de genre, que reste-t-il aux autorités pénitentiaires pour refuser un tel transfert? Or, C-16 ne prévoit aucune balise à ce titre. Quant aux enfants, concernant les enfants, le projet de loi C-16, en banalisant le changement d'identité de genre sans la définir, ouvre la porte aux pires dérives. On assiste à une augmentation fulgurante des demandes de changement de genre de la part d'enfants qui ne se conforment pas aux stéréotypes de genre. Par exemple, les petits garçons qui aiment les robes de princesse ou des adolescentes mal à l'aise avec leur sein. Les études sont pourtant claires. Plus de 80 des enfants qui présentent une dysphorie du genre deviennent des adultes confortables dans leur corps. Il y a beaucoup d'homophobie sous-jacente à cette volonté de traiter des enfants dont plusieurs sont possiblement gays, mais dont l'entourage préfère dire qu'ils sont nés dans le mauvais corps. Les mutilations comme les mastectomies sur les adolescentes, l'administration de bloqueurs de puberté et la prise d'hormones à vie peuvent avoir comme effet la stérilisation. Concluez, s'il vous plaît. Une, des mutilations, castrations chimiques. Comment cela pourrait-il être dans le meilleur intérêt des enfants? Merci de votre attention. Merci. Uh, we will now move to uh, Mr. Cameron. Sir. Honorable Senators, thank you for the opportunity to address this committee. We live in a free society that places a high value on personal autonomy and individual rights. In the context of free speech for all, I will illustrate what this means. In a free society, if I wish and my grades are good enough, I may go to medical school and I can earn the prestigious title of doctor, but I cannot compel people to refer to me as doctor and neither can the government. This is so despite the fact that I may strongly identify as a doctor, it might even be the driving force behind my identity. I can be a teacher at a university and be called professor, but I cannot be charged under human rights or criminal legislation if I refuse to call someone a professor, even if she is one. I can be a pastor or a priest or a rabbi and minister to my communities for 50 years, and yet I cannot compel society to address me as reverend or father or rabbi, and neither can the government. Her Royal Majesty may make me a knight, but I cannot be charged under human rights or criminal legislation for refusing to call a knight sir. In a free society, I am free to refer to myself as anything I want. I can refer to myself as a man or a woman or anything in between or something new entirely, but I cannot compel someone to refer to me as such or make them use my chosen identifier or pronoun, and neither can the government. The bill before you, Bill C-16, is a vague and defective piece of legislation because it lacks certainty. Its uncertainty allows for it to be interpreted as compelling the speech of Canadians, such as the forced use of gender-neutral pronouns. It is unprecedented to have human rights or criminal legislation require speech of its citizens. Prohibit speech, perhaps, in limited circumstances, but require it never, not in the civil context. It is contrary to the jurisprudence to have the power of the state compel the tongue of the citizen. The Supreme Court of Canada stated in National Bank of Canada versus Retail Clerks International Union, anything that forces someone to express opinions that are not their own is a penalty that is totalitarian and as such alien to the tradition of free nations like Canada even for the repression of the most serious crimes. Chief Justice McLaughlin in R versus Sharp made it clear that the fundamental freedom of, of, uh, of expression possessed by Canadians makes possible our liberty, our creativity, our democracy. It does this by protecting not only good and popular expression, but also unpopular and even offensive expression. And I would note that offensive is a subjective thing. What one finds offensive, another may not find offensive. And to a certain extent, I must choose to be offended by what I hear. Not everyone appreciates freedom of expression as they should. There can be little doubt that the Canadian Human Rights Commission, based on existing human rights jurisprudence, will compel service providers, employers, and employees to refer to transgender people by their self-chosen pronoun with legal consequences for those who refuse to use such language. This is already occurring and it should concern you. The Ontario Human Rights Commission explained that refusing to refer to a trans person by their chosen name and a personal pronoun that matches their gender identity or purposefully misgendering will likely be discrimination when it takes place in a social area covered by the code, including employment, housing, and services like education. 
Even supporters of Bill C-16, such as Unity University of Toronto Law Professor Brenda Kosman, admits that pronoun misuse can constitute a violation of human rights legislation. By not using someone's preferred pronoun, one could be subjected to fines, damages, termination of employment, ideological re-education in the form of sensitivity training, and other so-called remedies. The fact is, is that if C-16 is passed, it will result in the government forcing people to say and not say certain things under the threat of penalty. Honourable Senators, I ask you to think carefully about what kind of a nation you want to create today. Shall we have a Canada where the halls are full of tattletales over pronouns and the easily offended make still greater attempts to use the power of a supposedly neutral state to advance their own agenda? At what point does reason intrude in this conversation? At what point do the principles of a free society and the right to speak prevent state overreach? Do we really want a Canada where people walk on eggshells, afraid to speak, afraid not to speak? I do not. But I am afraid that you will not hear me for the clamor of those who do not realize what they are asking for. Many support this bill innocent of the repercussions of their own liberty, if it passes. But the fact is this. There are elements who support this bill that are hostile to the freedom that Canadians currently enjoy, not because they love a free society, but because they believe there is too much freedom in society. Please wrap up. These persons say it must be curtailed further. Parliament has an obligation to only enact legislation that is constitutional. In my respectful submission, this law in its current form offends the Charter of Rights under Section 2B. You okay. should want to amend the draft We're legislation. Have to move on. Uh, we're going to have to move on, uh, Professor Party. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for having me. Uh, I urge you not to pass Bill C-16 in its present form because of the threat that it poses to freedom of speech. I would like to make four points. Number one, forced speech is the most egregious infringement of freedom of speech, and freedom of speech may be the most important freedom that we have. Compelled speech puts words in the mouths of citizens and threatens to punish them if they do not comply. When speech is merely restricted, you can at least keep your thoughts to yourself. Forced speech makes people say things with which they do not agree. Number two, and I'm speaking here of the first part of Bill C-16, the part that amends the Human Rights Act. That amendment w may well require people to use non-gendered speech against their will. That is a form of forced speech. Now, the amendment, as has been pointed out, does not refer to speech specifically. So how do we know that that is, in fact, the case? Well, as has been mentioned, you must look to what the Human Rights Commissions say about it, because it is those commissions, both the Canadian version and the provincial versions for their provincial codes, that have the primary task of interpreting and applying those provisions. It is not the courts, first and foremost. It is not the government that controls the meaning. Once the statute is passed, its interpretation and application is largely controlled by the commission and then also by the tribunal. The courts will provide these bodies with a very high degree of deference. And it will be their call. The statute will mean what the commission and tribunal say that it means. So what do these bodies say that it means? You have heard these words before. I'm going to read them again because the point is important. The Ontario Human Rights Commission believes that the equivalent provisions in the Ontario Code mean or may very likely mean that people must use pronouns against their will. Refusing to refer to a trans person by their chosen name and a personal pronoun that matches their gender identity or purposely misgendering will likely be discrimination. Number, th number three, if the government does not intend 
for C-16 to force speech, then it would be a simple matter to say so in the bill. It is not complicated. And that indication would foreclose that interpretation by both the Commission and the Tribunal. Number four, the Honorable Minister of Justice appeared before this committee on May 4. I understood her to state that she did not believe that C-16 would require people to use pronouns against their will and that it was not the intent of the government to make them do so. My point is this, if that indeed is the case, then putting that intent in the legislation is simple as pie. It has so far declined to do so, and if that in fact is their intent, I cannot understand that reluctance. And I think I'll leave it there, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll move to questions beginning with uh, Senator Platt. Well, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you uh, to all uh, our witnesses. A uh, couple of questions, uh, Professor uh, Party. You uh, really started uh, very clearly talking about uh, the issue that I wanted to question you on, but I will pose the question in any event. Uh, you said here, and you mentioned in your written submission, that if the government does not intend for C-16 to force speech, it could easily make its intent clear, and you've confirmed that here. Why do you, and, and, and you are absolutely right with what you said you heard the minister say. I heard the minister say the same thing. I was sitting beside her. Why do you believe the government has not included this intent, if that is their intent? And in your opinion, what could the government have done to make Parliament's intention clear for future interpretation of this legislation? And maybe what can we do? Because there are those here that are continually saying that uh, it does not compel speech. And then there are those like yourself and others, and I believe that it does. And, and, and yet, uh, what could we do to make that explicitly clear that it would not compel speech? And then, Chair, I have one question for Mr. Cameron. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I have included in my written submission a very simple proposed amendment that would, in fact, put that government intent in place. It does not interfere in any way with the rest of the bill. It simply indicates that the bill is not intended to mean that the use of male and female pronouns to refer to any person would constitute a discriminatory practice. Now, there probably are various ways to word uh, uh, that kind of amendment, but, but the point is that the amendment is very simple. It's not legally difficult to do. As to the other question about why the government has declined to do so, uh, I'm not the government, so I could only speculate. Um, perhaps they would like to leave this question in the hands of the Commission and the Tribunal and have not actually determined which outcome they prefer, or perhaps they prefer the outcome that it looks like the Commission and Tribunal would, would, would come to. But that is pure speculation on my, point, on my part. I, I really cannot understand why, uh, given the intent that the minister suggested, why that simple step would not be taken. Well, we all like to speculate on why the government does certain things, so uh, we will continue. Uh, Mr. Cameron, um, we have constitutional experts, even right here at this, uh, this table, uh, maybe not on this side of the table, but certainly on the other with people like Senator Joyelle and uh, Senator Baker, who isn't here right now, but that are uh, arguing in favor of this bill, and others are, and yet you've used the Supreme Court. I will, uh, I will just read one passage here, a uh, ruling that the Supreme Court made in National Bank of Canada versus Retail Clerks International Union, and it goes like this. Anything that forces someone to express opinions that are not their own is a penalty that is totalitarian and as such alien to the tradition of free nations like Canada, even for the repression of the most serious crimes. Given that ruling by the Supreme Court, and again, you talked about the constitutionality, why do you believe this is not constitutional when other uh, constitutional experts 
say right in the face of that that, uh, well, that doesn't really matter. It's still constitutional. Thank you for the question, Honorable Senator. There's two reasons, really, I would say. The first is that the evidence that we're having uh, around this, uh, this gathering right now, and as, as uh, there have been other panels as well who have been here, the fact that we're debating whether or not it would compel speech or it wouldn't, and there are so many people who view it as being compulsory of unwanted speech, shows that there is a problem with the legislation. And criminal legislation can be struck down because it is vague or because it is uncertain or because it overreaches. And in my respectful submission, this legislation does all of those things. The second reason is that in the history of Canada, as far as I'm aware, there has never been a circumstance where the government passes a law to require uh, the citizen to speak in a certain way. That is, that is a gross state overreach, and it offends Section 2B of the Charter on its face. And this body has an obligation to pass only constitutional laws, and if you don't, the courts will fix it for you. So you should want to fix it here and now. If there is a second round, Chair, I have a question for the ladies. Okay. The Thank, you, Thank you, uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Chair. I don't think the courts will find anything because they won't find anything in the, in the, in the law that uh, imposes any pronoun or any noun. But anyways, uh, uh, I don't think it's a matter of compelled speech. I think it's, again, a matter of pure respect. I mean, uh, in a civilized society, there are things, there are simply things that you do not, that you cannot say. Uh, and laws protect uh, people against discriminatory language or hateful language. Uh, some people may think that uh, blacks should not be referred by their name, that they should all be called hey nigger, but you don't call them hey nigger, you call them by their name because this is things that you do. So the same kind of things would apply to transgender people. You don't call them by a name that they don't think they should be called them, you call them by the name that they choose and that by the pronoun that they choose because this is the respectful thing to do, isn't it? You want to take that first? Oh, sorry, were you addressing that question to me, sir? To you or to Mr. Pine? You go first. I, I'm happy to address the question, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, in our society, which is a free and just society, we do not compel respect. It is not the government's role to compel us to respect each other. And there is no case law which says that I must respect any person or that they must respect me. I'm a lawyer. I don't require people to speak to me uh, as Esquire or Mr. Cameron or, or Barrister and Solicitor. And if they refuse to address me as such, I would have no legal resor uh, recourse against them. Neither does a doctor, neither does a professor, neither does a knight, neither does a senator. Uh, just two quick points. Um, the first one is that the question about compelled speech is not whether or not the speech that's being compelled is reasonable speech. Any speech that is compelled is by definition unreasonable. If you had a statute, for example, that compelled people to say hello and please and thank you, all of which are perfectly reasonable things to say, the statute would be totalitarian because it puts words in the mouths of citizens. In a free country, people decide for themselves what to say. And as soon as you take that right away from them, you cannot claim any longer to be living in a free society. Second point, you cannot legislate respect. Respect is an emotional and intellectual response to something and somebody. It is earned and develops over time. All you've done is, is take the force of the state to create the pretense of respect. And that is a sad facsimile. But you can certainly legislate to prevent lack of respect. And again, with respect, there is nothing in the legislation that mandates pronouns or nouns. Uh, there is nothing in the legislation that says that. I, 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 I agree that it does not refer to speech. And, and in fact, I, I, I hope that we would agree. I, I, it sounds like you interpret the statute as though it does not require speech and should not require speech. I agree with you. And all I'm saying is it does leave open that possibility because of the control the commission has. As an, and there is an easy way to make sure that your objective and mine are met and that is to insert a very simple amendment saying what you just said. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you, uh, Senator Boisvenu. Alors, euh, je vais laisser le temps à nos invités de se, de se mettre la traduction à l'oreillette. Ça va, euh, M. Padré, vous m'entendez bien, M. Cameron. Alors, ma question est pour vous, euh, euh, Maître Cameron. Euh, il y a plusieurs observateurs qui, euh, qui affirment que cette loi-là, dans sa rédaction, elle est très mal écrite. Du moins, elle est mal écrite, mal définie. Particulièrement en ce qui concerne l'absence de définition euh, des termes identité de genre et expression de genre. Alors, j'aurais deux questions à ce niveau-là. La première, c'est, est-ce que vous pouvez commenter sur les risques qui sont associés à l'absence de définition précise par rapport à ces deux termes-là? Et la, ma deuxième question, qui serait une conséquence de la première, à cause de l'absence de ces termes-là, est-ce qu'il y a risque d'avoir plus d'accusations portées envers les citoyens? Thank you for the question, sir. Uh, in response to the first question, um, there, there are risks uh, in regard to uncertainty. And one of the problems is with this legislation is that it introduces the, the thorny subject of gender identity into a realm that is filled with rel relatively stable and certain categories. The question of gender identity has a level of subjectivity that some of the other Uh, um, uh, categories of, the, of uh, the human rights legislation does not have. They are not subjective. For example, um, if I have a religious belief, it is my belief, um, and uh, it's, it's personal. But uh, uh, if I am a woman or a man, uh, it is something that is objective. But there is a level of subjectivity that is in disagreement in the scientific community and in the psychological community and, this, and in the sociological community in regard to gender identity. People disagree on what it means. This side of the table disagrees. This side of the table disagrees. The whole room disagrees. Because there is disagreement, when you have something that says that there is a, that there is a prohibition against uh, doing something towards a specific category, uh, because there is uncertainty, Um, in regard to this term, there is vagueness, and that leads to risks. And so it can be somebody's perception on one side, uh, uh, somebody in a hallway, or a professor, or an employee, or a boss, or a judge, that what was said um, is, uh, is an insult to gender identity. But other people may not see it that, the same way, and that's because that term remains undefined. And uh, uh, that's a substantial problem, and it renders the legislation unconstitutional. Et ma deuxième question, c'était, est-ce que le fait de ne pas avoir des, des définitions précises peut amener effectivement à ce qu'il y ait plus d'accusations qui soient portées? Certainly. And um, different people who support this legislation have, a different, have different agendas. Some people want this because they feel that without it, the trans community will not be treated fairly. Some people think that there is too much freedom of speech to be disrespectful in society, and so we need to curtail the level of freedom in people's speech. But irrespective, because of the uncertainty, accusations in regard to what or is not an insult or inciting hatred towards gender identity will absolutely increase because people's perception of what it is or may not be. Uh, and then you have unfortunate people hauled in front of tribunals and courts to answer for something that is innocuous and is is in accordance with their right as Canadians uh, to uh, for free speech under Section 2B anyways. So it, it will create confusion, which is undesirable. Okay. Senator Amadvar. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Professor Pardy, I, I note with some interest that in January of this year you debated Professor Jordan Peterson, who was our uh, witness just earlier, on the compelled use of pronouns and C-16, and you debated in favor of C-16. I wonder if you can recall <coughs> your arguments in favor of C-16 and compelled pronouns. Uh, I sh certainly, but I, sh I should give some context to that debate. Uh, it occurred in the following way. Uh, Dr. Peterson was coming in to do the debate, and on my faculty, the hosts of the uh, debate went round to all the various faculty who, uh, who, who were of a different opinion than Dr. Peterson to invite them to debate him. And they declined. And so they came to me, even though they knew I agreed with him, and asked me to play devil's advocate, which I did do. 
Um, what, one of my arguments was that there is, there's no, I said, that, look, there's no such thing as free speech. We have restrictions all over the place. We have defamation, we have negligence, we have uh, counseling crimes. To say that there is freedom of speech is disingenuous. And of course, that argument is not correct. We do have freedom of speech, and those infringements are exceptions. And all those exceptions are restrictions on speech. And this infringement of freedom of speech is, is, is categorically different because it, as I said before, puts words in the mouths of citizens, which those other restrictions do not do. In order to avoid liability and defamation, all you have to do is, is keep your opinions to yourself. I'm not endorsing those other instances of, freedom of, of, of infringement of freedom of speech, but I am saying that they are less severe than the one that we were talking about today. Okay. See the transcript. Uh, Senator McDonald. Thank you, Chair. I have a question for you, Mr. Cardi, if you don't mind. Um, a lot of discussions surrounding this bill, you keep hearing that it's objective, personal, identity-based. Um, people say that religion is personal and subjective and identity-based, so what's the big deal? So I'm just saying, asking you, how do you respond to that? I respond this way. Uh, I, I think the, those two kinds of interests are given a different status. If you have the freedom of religion, then it gives you the freedom to determine your own beliefs. Yes. And that, that's appropriate. Yes. Um, trans people and non-gendered people should also have the freedom to determine how they want to portray themselves to the world. Yes. Those are the equivalents. But here is the one thing that people who claim freedom of religion do not have. They do not have the right to demand that other people agree. Mm -hmm. The freedom of religion is only the freedom not to be interfered with. Mm -hmm. And I would be the first one to suggest that trans people and non-gender people have the freedom to do the same. They have the freedom to decide for themselves how to portray themselves in the world. But the rest of us also have the freedom to come to our own opinions about things, including religion and including transgendered matters. We have, in a free country, all of us have the freedom to come to our own conclusions. And I think that is the distinction between the, the two grounds that you spoke of. Thank you. You make the distinction very well. Thank you. Senator Joel. Plath has invited me to uh, to join the uh, the debate, and I and I will accept that invitation, Senator. Thank you. Um, as you know, the the charter contains a list of rights, and the uh, the Supreme Court has clearly recognized that there is no one right superior to the other. They are all rights that exist simultaneously in anyone's uh, person uh, capacity. Uh, to intervene in public debates. Uh, <clears throat> for instance, in case that you you raised, that it would be an infringement on Section 2B, which is, you know, freedom of thought, freedom of discussion, freedom of debate, would, in con would be in conflict with Section 15 to the equality clause, you know, to the benefit of the law. And, of course, all those rights, whatever they are, are subjected to reasonable limits in a free and democratic society. And the court has established clearly the test, you know, to, to impose, to conclude if the democratic society or reasonableness is met with a limit. So if you, if you are so, um, you know, if you hold the conclusion very, very strongly that uh, this bill is an infringement on the Charter, instead of building it into it an exception, why should we not consider to refer the bill to the court? So that the Supreme Court would pronounce if this bill is constitutional or not, and it, it would put an end to, you know, to the debate, and everybody in Canada would would recognize the wisdom of the Supreme Court in relation to the interpretation of the alleged violation of Section 2. It seems to me that there is a way around 
you know, the, uh, the arguments sure. that uh, this bill is an infringement, and we would know, considering the fact that in almost 10 provinces, I think our colleague Senator Baker has been listing the provinces in which there are provincial legislation of a similar nature, then we would, we would have a law in the land that would be final, and everybody would abide by it and adjust to it. So is it not the more, you know, less expensive, uh, less, um, more efficient way to address the constitutional doubt that you have with the bill instead of trying to amend it? Thank you for the question, sir. Um, from my perspective, the contention in regard to this bill is a red flag in regard to the bill. And so the proper thing to do is to address the contention not necessarily to refer the contention to a, a, a court comprised of individuals who will have their own contention, perhaps. Uh, you've heard from lots of witnesses uh, why they're concerned about this bill, uh, people who are versed in the criminal law and people who are versed in the charter. Uh, so it, it seems to me to be uh, in order to, if you want to uphold the principles of a free society, the proper thing to do is to put an amendment into the bill to address the concerns which a lot of people have. Uh, but of course, it's open to, uh, to uh, the Senate to refer the, the bill to the Supreme Court of Canada and obtain a ruling. Well, we could amend the bill saying, you know, the bill will not be enacted, uh, you know, following pending a reference to the Supreme Court. There's a possibility to do that. But uh, of course, it's not the way you have proposed. You, you prefer that the legislation be, uh, be amended and then challenged in court because one way, one day or the other, as we heard from the previous witnesses that that kind of proposal, you know, is susceptible of, of court challenge. But it's not even clear what it is you're trying to do. I mean, yeah. uh, is, is, is the bill intended to force speech or not? People are saying, no, no, it doesn't do that. If that's what you mean, then say so. If you do mean that, then let's say that. I mean, why would you want the courts to be making the law in the country? You're the legislature. Legislate. Well, we can legislate as long as we want, but uh, you contend that if we legislate this bill, it would be unconstitutional. That, not that, not if you put in the amendment, sir. No, 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 but on the basis of what it is now. So, in other words, what you tell me is that if this bill is not amended, you know, you would be of the opinion that it could be challenged and it but, would be challenged. But at challenged this, at this stage, you don't even know what it is that the court's going to be looking at because you haven't had it interpreted by the commission yet. You, it, it's a complete open book. Why don't you decide what it is that you want the statute to actually say and well, put that in place and, well, and then if it runs into constitutional I'll trouble... I'll have to leave it there, Senator Frum. Uh, Mr. Cameron, you got cut off at the beginning when you were about to suggest an amendment and I just want to invite you to, to finish that, uh, that thought. And uh, Mr. Party, also you... you said you had the suggestion for your amendment in your written submission, which I don't have, so I'm just wondering if you could also uh, explain it again. Um, so I want to give each of you a chance to make your proposal. So I, I'll use Professor Peterson as an example uh, in regard to the amendment. He's an academic. He wants to write from an academic perspective in regard to this issue. He wants to consider it from a scientific and sociological and psychological perspective, and he wants to add to what really is a fledgling body of work at this point in time in regard to scientific literature on this particular issue. And it's one that, let's face it, let's not ignore the reality. There's a lot of disagreement over gender identity um, in the scientific community. So in order to protect people like Professor Peterson, who from my perspective, have a right to study and then write about their findings without fear of running afoul of Section 319 of the Criminal Code, what should be done is an amendment should be drafted that says that the failure, uh, um, for ease of clarity, uh, the failure uh, or disinclination to use uh, gender-neutral pronouns or gender, identifi gender identifiers shall uh, in no way be construed to contravene this statute, either in regard to the criminal context or the Human Rights Code. And uh, I think Professor Purdy and myself more or less agree on that point, that um, that, that would be something that would, would go a long ways to, to show what the government is trying to do and show that they care about the rights of Canadians who have a right to have an opinion on this issue and express it. Thank you for the question. I will just read it to you very quickly because it's very short. 
The following section, this is to be added to the, the bill. The following section is added to the Canadian Human Rights Act. 3.1a, nothing in this act shall require any person to use particular words or phrases to refer to any other person. B, for greater certainty, but not so as to affect the generality of subsection A, the use of male and female pronouns to refer to any person does not constitute a discriminatory practice. Okay, but there, there, that, if you took that last phrase, that does in fact conflict with gender expression. Uh, that, no. that is, a, that, the, 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 the inclusion of the term gender expression in this bill is precisely so that people don't, do, can compel people to use pronouns that do not conform to male or female. Well, but, but this is the question though, right? I mean, yes. if gender expression is, is to mean that you must use certain pronouns, then we do have forced speech. That's the question. That is not the only possible interpretation of gender expression. What it also could mean is people are free to express their gender in the way they see fit, and they're not allowed to be denied a job for that reason. That would be the, the meaning that I would uh, expect would be standard and most like the, the effect of the other kinds of grounds that are now in, in the Act. Thank you. Okay. Senator Dupuy. La question principale, c'est la suivante. Dans votre proposition d'amendement, que moi je vois à la page 7 de votre présentation, euh, est-ce qu'il n'y a pas euh, Est-ce que vous avez considéré la possibilité qu'en incluant ce genre d'amendement-là, on vienne diminuer la théorie actuelle qui veut que les droits qui sont reconnus dans la loi sur les droits de la personne sont tous égaux et qu'ils n'ont pas un statut particulier qui les mette à l'abri d'une façon ou d'une autre des autres droits. Donc, est-ce qu'en en, en introduisant ce genre d'amendement, on ne se trouve pas à attirer l'attention sur un motif? Parce que là, on l'ajouterait au projet de loi tel qu'il est, là, c'est ça. Est-ce qu'à ce, qu ce moment-là, on ne vient pas euh, peut-être diminuer la protection des autres motifs de discrimination? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that's because this is a ground that has this difference. It is the only one, really, that raises this question of language. And the irony here is that when it comes to forced speech, we are in a situation where the, this ground and the people within this group, if, if you can call it a group, will end up with more rights than anybody else because they are the only people who are entitled to require people to change their speech. I don't, I can't imagine any of the other grounds having that effect. If you are uh, looking at this discrimination on the basis of, uh, of sex or age, I mean, there's no language question in there. And as my friend, Mr. Cameron, has suggested, there isn't anybody else in society who has the ability to demand being addressed by a certain word. If you address me by a word that I don't like, that's, that's too bad. This, the one exception will be this ground and this group. Je veux juste vous référer à l'autre argument qui a été soulevé par le groupe qui est devant nous aujourd'hui, la question de protection des droits des femmes. Dans le cas du motif sexe, pour ce qui est des femmes, il y a encore beaucoup de personnes de sexe masculin au Canada qui considèrent que traiter des femmes de n'importe quel nom, ce n'est pas un problème. Or, on a protégé dans ce cas-ci la raison pour laquelle on a décidé d'interdire la discrimination fondée sur le sexe, la discrimination ou le harcèlement d'ailleurs. C'est précisément parce que des gens se croyaient la possibilité de dire n'importe quel langage. Mais ça ne veut pas dire que les gens euh, ne peuvent plus parler au Canada. Mais il y a une interdiction d'utiliser des termes euh, qui sont tellement, qui dépassent une certaine limite qui a été établie par la jurisprudence. 
Alors, c'est dans ce sens-là que je me demandais, est-ce qu'à ce moment-là, on ne vient pas court-circuiter l'égalité de euh, la protection qu'on donne à, à différents motifs? I, I don't think so. I think the key word in your question was prohibition. When it comes to discrimination that might be reflected in language, you're suggesting that there might be prohibition on referring to people in a certain way. Maybe that is so, but it is still a prohibition, not a requirement. In this case, we're talking about being required to take a certain pronoun identified by a certain person, and that person saying, you will use this particular word to refer to me, or I will report you to the Human Rights Commission. That does not happen with any other ground in the act. Est-ce que je peux rapidement? Non, sorry. Okay. In the second round, uh, Senator Batters. Thanks very much. Um, thank you all of you for being here. And uh, if I can address this to one of the women from the Quebec Women's Rights Association, could you please tell us what um, you think the impact of this particular bill could be on safe spaces for women? La, la reconnaissance de l'identité de genre euh, permet à un homme qui se sent euh, femme d'entrer dans des espaces qui étaient réservés aux femmes sur la base du sexe. Les femmes ont mis beaucoup de temps à obtenir des protections, non pas sur la base du genre, mais sur la base du sexe. Dans la discussion sur ce sujet, il y a beaucoup de confusion entre les deux termes, particulièrement en anglais, où souvent on utilise le mot « gender » à la place du mot « sexe ». En français, on utilise de façon différente et nous avons utilisé euh, les mots et les termes tels que le gouvernement du Canada officiellement euh, le fait et de même que toutes les organisations euh, qui se penchent sur l'égalité entre les hommes et les femmes. Alors, il y a des droits qui sont basés sur le sexe des femmes et non pas sur leur genre. Ce n'est pas parce que des femmes portent des souliers ou s'habillent de telle façon ou sont soumises ou dont les stéréotypes de genre. Ce n'est pas pour ça qu'elles ont besoin d'espaces séparés. C'est pour leur protection. On a présenté dans le PowerPoint qu'on a remis à chaque personne présente des statistiques sur la violence faite aux femmes. Cette violence masculine, hélas, elle existe. Et il y a des protections qui ont été accordées aux femmes qui sont les principales victimes de cette violence masculine. Les chiffres de Statistique Canada le confirment, la violence contre les femmes est bien présente et les femmes ont donc des raisons précises et avérées euh, euh, de s'assurer de leur sécurité. Et le gouvernement du Canada, encore récemment, par le biais de sa ministre de la Condition féminine, s'est engagé à prévenir la violence contre les femmes lors de sa déclaration à l'ONU le 15 mars dernier. À partir du moment où le concept d'identité de genre qui n'est pas défini comme on l'a vu tout à l'heure et qui permet, qui est très subjectif et qui est, qui est non vérifiable, ça veut dire que n'importe quel homme peut invoquer une identité de genre pour pénétrer dans des espaces sécuritaires pour les femmes, espaces basés sur le sexe. Si on reconnaît l'identité de genre comme étant l'équivalent du sexe, Bien, on vient d'effacer les protections basées sur le sexe. Et évidemment, c'est une préoccupation. On a fait exemple, deux exemples avec les prisons et avec euh, les sports, où les différences physiques, notamment dans les sports, sont évidentes. Même Serena Williams, une grande championne de tennis, il n'y en a pas de meilleure, dit elle-même qu'elle ne pourrait pas battre les 100 meilleurs joueurs de tennis. Donc, quand on arrive dans la compétition sportive, on s'aperçoit que les différences basées sur le sexe sont importantes et les nier, c'est nier les droits des femmes. Et on a un gouvernement qui s'est quand même engagé depuis la signature de la CEDEF en 1982, la Convention pour l'élimination des discriminations à l'endroit des femmes. Il s'est engagé à lutter contre les discriminations faites aux femmes et à lutter pour leur égalité. Et leur égalité, ça signifie, signifie excusez-moi, de, euh, de protéger les espaces qui leur sont accordés sur la base du sexe, de protéger des programmes, comme par exemple l'accès à des postes de pouvoir. Euh, la, il y a des programmes dans les différentes provinces, comme au Canada, pour essayer d'augmenter la participation des femmes dans des lieux de pouvoir. Et, il y a des programmes aussi pour les vestiaires, des, des, des endroits sécuritaires pour les femmes. Et dans les prisons, eh bien là aussi, c'est un problème qui se pose parce qu'on a euh, des, des détenus masculins qui ont été reconnus coupables 
de violences sexuelles à l'endroit des femmes, c'est pour ça qu'ils sont en prison. Il n'y a rien qui les empêche d'invoquer une identité de genre pour demander un transfert dans les prisons euh, de femmes. Et en, en Grande-Bretagne, où on a étudié un projet de loi similaire à C16, c'est exactement ce que l'Association des spécialistes du genre est venue dire. Après avoir étudié des détenus, la demande des détenus qui demandaient à être transférés dans une prison pour femmes, ils n'ont rien à perdre. Ils sont en prison pour 20 ans, 25 ans, 30 ans. Alors, il n'y a rien qui empêche ces détenus qui ont été reconnus coupables de violence d'être, de demander un transfert. Et à ce moment-là, ce sont les femmes dans les prisons qu'on met en danger. Alors, nous, ça nous préoccupe de, euh, de voir que, depuis le début, je vous remercie de votre question, mais la question des femmes, notamment euh, au débat à la Chambre des communes, a to, été absolument euh, absente. Je vais devoir le laisser là. Je suis désolé. Une dernière question finale de la Sénateur Gold. C'est juste un petit suivi de la dernière question. Est-ce que la solution euh, de vos préoccupations, que je, je comprends et je respecte, est-ce que c'est d'éliminer la protection contre la discrimination pour les transgenres ou de reconnaître qu'il y a des contextes, peut-être les deux et d'autres que vous avez soulignés, dans les contextes dans lesquels une discrimination, entre guillemets, soit, sera raisonnable compte tenu du besoin de la protection des femmes ou les différences physiques ou peu importe? En 2013, le président de la Commission canadienne des droits de la personne avait affirmé que les droits des personnes transgenres étaient déjà protégés par les chartes et que le tri, le, la Commission recevait déjà des plaintes et traitait des plaintes, donc contre, pour discrimination contre les personnes transgenres. Nous sommes tout à fait d'accord avec ça. Nous pensons qu'il faut effectivement protéger les personnes qui ne se conforment pas aux stéréotypes de genre associés à leur sexe de naissance. Ces personnes-là ne devraient pas perdre leur emploi, ne devraient pas être discriminées. Ce sur quoi nous posons des questions, effectivement, est-ce qu'il n'y a pas des balises à poser? Et à partir du moment où ce sont des protections basées sur le sexe, est-ce que l'identité de genre devient automatiquement synonyme d'un changement de sexe? On peut faire un changement de genre. Ça, c'est évident. Il y en a plein qui le font. Mais le changement de sexe, ça ne se fait pas. Biologiquement, ça ne se fait pas. Alors, dans certaines circonstances, L'appartenance à un sexe, le sexe féminin, parce que c'est là que les dangers se posent, c'est euh, important de, de les respecter. Et pour en avoir le cœur net, nous, on a demandé déjà au moment de l'adoption du projet de loi par le gouvernement de faire une analyse comparative selon les sexes. C'est un engagement du gouvernement du Canada de s'assurer, avant d'adopter un projet de loi, que la loi ne va pas brimer les droits des femmes et qu'elle va au contraire favoriser éventuellement les droits des femmes. Alors, euh, nous, notre quête principale, c'est que cette, euh, euh, cette euh, analyse comparative selon les sexes, telle que le rappelait d'ailleurs le vérificateur général en 2016, c'est que cette euh, analyse soit faite et qu'on puisse jauger là où, effectivement, il pourrait y avoir des différences d'application pour assurer les droits des femmes, notamment leur droit à la sécurité. Merci. OK, thank you. Uh, witnesses, thank you all for uh, being here today and uh, assisting the committee in its consideration of C-16. Much appreciated. That concludes the meeting for today. Meeting